so, so yes. So basically, our society pressures for people to stay monogamous, even though maybe it's not in their nature, has kept evolution from weeding out smaller penis in the sky. <laughs> or men who are lousy lovers, perhaps. Um, yeah, although you know that's a fairly recent change. Probably hasn't had much effect on on human evolution. Uh, you know, cultural evolution is so much faster than biological evolution. All right. kinds of weird stuff. I just think we would have less of a range of sizes than we do if you know if if women had multiple partners and there was a washing out effect. Would Evolution mean that the mystery still stands. Uh, we're, okay. we're we're chipping away at it. Sorry. Some recent hypothesis. Some recent hypotheses, uh, and there seems to be some increasing amount of thoughtful evidence and uh, hmm. circumstantial evidence uh, to indicate that humans went went through a very rapid and remarkable uh, evolution in our brain size um, and fairly fairly recently done our evolution. <coughs> Apparently coinciding with uh, rapid and dramatic changes in, in the Earth climate and distribution of plants. Yeah. Um, can, can you hypothesize a timeline for well, there's really very is little to that, or they go back farther. Well, so, so in the big picture, look at it this way: human evolution really started about three million years ago, the same time that the ice ages began. So, three million prior to three million years ago, we didn't have this cycle, these cycles, ice ages. That's when they started, and really triggered by North and South America connecting, changing the the, the current pattern of the ocean. So that started these ice ages, which created these climate fluctuations with a period of about 100,000 years. We've had about 30 cycles of ice age, major cycles, with a lot of the small cycles in between since then, which have pushed climate zones north and south, created deserts, grew tropical forests, shrunk them back down again, and it was the shrinkage of those forests and the expansion of the savannas that really caused that triggered the development of these big brain apes that right. the humans. Okay. Okay. So that part seems pretty clear, that big picture. And we see a steady increase in brain size through that those last three million years. Um, some of these other things, like brain, it's easy to measure a brain size, right? You got a skull, you, you measure the volume. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty obvious. Some of these, like these soft tissues, um, there, there's no evidence whatsoever. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting question. When did these things happen? You know, some of these adaptations that were very functional for us two million years ago, uh, a million years later, may have been no longer useful, but may have been locked into our phenotype, and we've been stuck with them. So, yeah, those are... Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm raising some questions here, and um, hopefully in the, in the future we'll get some answers. I saw a documentary recently called uh, The Anatomy of uh, Human Sexuality, I think it was called. The Anatomy of Love, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Helen Fisher has a very good book called The Anatomy of Love. It talks about a lot of It was uh, uh, quite, um, uh, quite visual, quite uh, mm -hmm. specific, and on, on uh, public TV. And uh, I enjoyed it a lot, but it uh, talked about the fact that when uh, primates, you know, were starting to walk directly, then that changed the way that they uh, had sex. And uh, eventually, uh, the face-to-face -face kind of missionary position um, <clears throat> favored women that had that were attract had attractive and uh, large breasts. Um, but it also said that in making love face to face, you can see the emotions of your partner, which uh, that emotional uh, uh, trigger uh, uh, helps in making us more sexual.
Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. There's, just, there's been a lot of nonsense written about this, this topic. Desmond Morris came up with the idea of the large breast as a replacement for the butt as we went from a yeah. doggy style to a face-to-face, yeah. -face, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is nonsense. But um, it's fun to speculate about. Um, we, can, we can talk about some of those, uh, some of those questions and, and theories later on. Um, let's move on to the cultural evolution. Um, we've reviewed the biological evolution of the mammalian genitalia and the socio-biological evolution of our sexual instincts, which brings us to the cultural evolution of sexual ethics. Uh, this is where things get weird. Uh, because we're such erotic animals, cultures have had to develop extraordinary measures to control sexual behavior. Because we're so adaptable and our behavior is so flexible, culture has been able to impose a bizarre array of regulatory mechanisms to form or redirect our sexual instincts. So let's, let's, let's look at that spectrum objectively. So the first thing to understand is the driving factor in their evolution, cultural survival. And the two factors most important there are, number one, population regulation. Cultures need enough people to defend against external attack, but not too many, to prevent habitat destruction. Ecological damage has been the leading cause of cultural extinction over the centuries. And two, ensuring that children are adequately provisioned so that the culture can be transmitted to them. The next generation has to acquire the culture by learning for the culture to survive. And as cultures become more complex, a longer period of education is required. So to control population growth, females are the limiting factor. Historically, female infanticide has been widely practiced in limited population. But motivating parents to kill their baby daughters is difficult. It goes against our human instincts. So it must be enabled with a nasty anti-female ideology. So, why anti-female? Because killing male babies really doesn't have much of an effect on population growth. Consequently, females and baby girls are born the brunt of low-tech population Another approach is the diversion of male sex drive, as in the ideology of sacred semen, which is quite an amazing story. A totally different approach is the warrior ethic developed in Scythia, the steppes of Eurasia, Northern Europe. Polyandry, multiple husbands for a single wife, a much more humane system, difficult to implement, however, and Tibet is the only place where it's been used on a significant scale. It has some important lessons for us, though. And finally, we'll look at various forms of bodily modification that have been used as part of the population control system. So let's look at some of these customs in more detail. The overpopulation is the leading cause of death for culture. It's also the primary driver for cultural innovation. Historically, population pressure leads to a resource crisis, which is either solved, generally with technology improvements, or else it results in cultural collapse. So some of the solutions are pretty awful. It's very common for overpopulated cultures to develop an anti-female, anti-sex ideology as part of their solution set. In fact, it's the most common approach found worldwide. The Middle Eastern culture zone is a good example. It was the first to suffer from overpopulation, and even now, we're still suffering from the ideological solutions that evolved there in response. Consider these basic dichotomies within the ideology. A spiritual man raises his eyes to heaven, but the material girls always drag him down to the filth. These themes are found throughout Middle Eastern religion and culture in Zoroastrianism, early Mesopotamia, Egypt, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Manichaeism. According to the Bible, the sin of Eve damned all of mankind. But God piled on some additional punishments just for women. He multiplied the pain of childbirth as payback to the apple, and menstruation is still called the curse because of the gift from a jealous God. So to remove females from the breeding pool, the most common method has been female advancement. Here are the most common forms, from deliberate overkilling to lowered biological and emotional support. Correlated with these techniques are momicidal tendencies. Uh, pregnant women and nursing mothers are often overworked and underfed. And for faster results, they can always be accused of witchcraft. Taken together, all these methods work to limit population growth. Now, throughout East Asia, from North China down to India and all the way to New Guinea, you find an extreme pro-male ideology that also operates to limit population growth. 
In this system, semen is the precious bodily fluid, highly charged with vital life force. Men are taught to preserve their semen. It keeps them healthy and even make them immortal. Advanced Taoist and Tantric sexual techniques train men to orgasm without ejaculating. That way, their yang energy is lost, but instead it travels up the spine and into the brain. Uh, here we see one of the eight, one of the eight immortals of Chinese legend. Clearly, this guy hasn't ejaculated in the ages. <laughs> So the East Asian semen of life system doesn't work all that well on its own. It relies too much on self-control. But it's proven very beneficial as part of a general emphasis on internal self-discipline. And we see the consequences today in China, Korea, and Japan. India is a somewhat different situation because their cultural evolution was disrupted by the Muslim conquest a thousand years ago, which imposed a brutal anti-female, anti-sex layer on a culture that had been a lot more pro-female and pro-love. But at the far southern extreme of this ideological zone, right on the border of Australia, we reach a unique case of New Guinea. They retain the belief that a man will die once he ejaculates his last drop of semen, an idea we find in Taoist writings from China 2,000 years ago. But they add a twist. Semen is even more precious because they're not making it anymore. Men can't produce their own semen. They can only get it from other men. We'll go into some gory details in the next slide. That's a really good marketing. Yeah. Uh, so ritualized homosexuality has appeared in many different societies around the world. And it's a natural adjunct to the semen of life ideology. It's appeared in ancient Greece, Persia, Mexico, and Peru, but only in New Guinea has it survived in modern times. Around the age of 8 or 10, young boys in New Guinea highlands start to hang out in the men's house. No girls allowed. Uh, there they start their education, learning how to be men, and building up their semen supplies. Since they can't manufacture their own, they have to get it where they can. It's a spermatic Ponzi scheme. Every man <laughs> needs to give at least as many BJs when he's a boy, and he got to swallow, otherwise no use, for every ejaculation he hopes to have over the rest of his life. It's all part of a complex, population control system that evolved over time in the highlands. Among the adult men, their sexual energies are diverted away from women and toward boys. And not just by this ritualized homosexuality, but also by a complicated system of taboos that restrict when it's permissible for men to have sex with their wives. Over the course of a year, over 200 days of taboo. That, that also decreases rates of insemination and population growth. And while semen is the elixir of life, Menstrual blood is considered a deadly poison, the anti semen A single drop can kill a man. If a man gets sick, the first cause is suspected to be menstrual pollution. Nothing could be easier for a woman than to slip a little poison into a man's sweet potato. And that's witchcraft. Capital offense. And the Marin Annan provides an instructive example of how cultural evolution can take a wrong turn. For this tribe, the belief is that a new bride should be fertilized with as much of the elixir of life as possible. So she's gang raped by as many as ten of her new in-laws on her wedding night. The brides have trouble walking the next day, and high levels of pelvic inflammation and infections render many of these women infertile. So the Marin and Anim culture may not be around much longer. And of course you know what their fundamentalists conclude from that. Those brides didn't get enough baby juice. Need more, need more guys next time. So in New Guinea, we see an artificial homosexuality imposed upon individuals by culture. We should contrast that with natural homosexuality, which is a normal element of human nature. We know that gayness is normal because it's found among many different species, and the evolutionary benefits are clear. In hunter-gatherer societies, the shaman will often be gay, and his close genetic relatives, nieces and nephews, they will benefit from his support. From a selfish gene standpoint, homosexuality is the most altruistic of adaptations. You can't have a majority gay population, of course. It has to be a recessive trait. But having a gay minority is advantageous to group survival. Gay men score highly on tests of intelligence and creativity. And in the U.S., they're overrepresented in fields like medicine, law, science, engineering, and the arts. So don't fear the queer. <laughs> 